Uh, grace be unto you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, here we are. It's the 4th of July weekend. For Americans, it's a time to celebrate, to really celebrate, and a time to remember who we are as a nation and as a people of faith. And maybe just a little bit about how we got this way. I think of our secular holidays, that is, holidays that are not somehow related to our religious celebrations. The 4th of July is definitely one of our favorites. It certainly stands up as one of mine. I've enjoyed it as a family holiday actually for as long back as I can remember. In our growing up years in our family, my mom and dad would load us kids in the family car and we'd head off to see the local fireworks display. Back in those days, fireworks were legal and many of the neighbors would provide their own displays. And we kids with adult supervision, yes, we would play with sparklers and firecrackers and cherry bombs and rockets and Roman candles and those rather weird little pellets that would grow into long black snakes when you lit a match to them. You know what else? The next morning, the neighborhood kids would scour the neighborhood in search of anything at all that wasn't previously exploded. And fortunately, we came out of that period with all of our fingers in still intact and our eyes still where they belonged in the front of our head. Nancy and I continued taking our children to see the fireworks displays and would often head down to Grant Park in Chicago where we would have both a live concert and a grand display of fireworks over Lake Michigan. And nowadays, we enjoy taking the uh, 3rd of July concert in over at the Starlight with our own Rockford Symphony playing patriotic tunes and then we catch the local fireworks on the evening of the 4th. It's fun. One of the words that Isaiah spoke was his instruction to not remember the former things or consider the things of old. His intent was that we should look forward and to see God working in a way of new creation and of new possibilities. And rather than brooding over past history during our 4th of July festivities, we celebrate it, drawing richness and meaning from the events that mark the beginning of our nation's independence. In this most patriotic of holidays, we celebrate the birth of what it means to be a nation conceived in the ideals of democracy and able to identify that which is unique and rich in the traditions of our people, the many traditions of our people. Well, how do we put it all together? Okay, that's my title, Fireworks and Faith. I was warned before the service started that if I set anything off here, I should be careful and make sure I throw it out first. But where would I throw it? <laughs> My wife, Nancy, and I have always attempted to make history a very vital part of our vacation travels. We have walked the streets of Williamsburg and stood on the porch of Washington's home at Mount Vernon. We have visited the iconic sites of Washington, D.C., and we have immersed ourselves into the historical settings of Philadelphia and Independence Hall. We have trod the turf and structures of Yorktown, Monticello, and Illinois, New Salem. We've traveled the Civil War battlefields and so stood on the sacred ground of Gettysburg. And we have visited utopian communities such as Zor over in Ohio, New Harmony in Indiana, the Shakers settlement in Kentucky, Oneida in their early Iowa settlements, and Bishop Hill right down in central Illinois. And there's also Nauvoo, that early Mormon settlement, and Zion, now a prosperous suburb of Chicago that started out as a utopian vision. And all of these latter, the utopian settlements, 
They all began as experiments in faith growing out of a deep desire for religious freedom along with an intentional commitment to live in authentic Christian community. All of them are witnesses, all of these are witness to, to a nation that is stretching and growing through the pangs of birth and the tantalizing taste of independence. There is something about visiting all of these places, the shrines of our nation's birth and history, that touches some deeply laid emotions and seminal meaning that lies, I think, within each of us. The fireworks that dotted the skies around the nation in Friday's celebrations pale in comparison to the fire of faith and the seeds of freedom that undergird the importance of our nation's Independence Day. Some of the founding parents, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin most notably, were anti-clerical Christians who were strongly influenced by English deists and the Enlightenment. And as such, they were believers in God as the creator and sustainer of the universe, but they would question the divinity of Christ. Jefferson, interested as he was more in the philosophy and the teaching of Jesus than in Jesus' place in the Godhead, actually cut and pasted sections of the New Testament together in what he, was, he determined to be a probable chronological order. It included the life and teachings of Jesus, but it left out the signs and the miracles. And that has become known to us as the Jefferson Bible. And if you've got a computer and check Google, you can probably find some of it up there. Jefferson, himself an Anglican, attended church regularly and for a time even served as a vestryman. Some, most notably Thomas Paine, did identify themselves as deists, and together these were men who believed in God, or at least acknowledged a supreme being or a rational providential cause but they walked away from any of the kind of dogmatic literalism that was so prevalent in, in the churches in their day. Others, like John Adams and John Hancock, were Congregationalists, a predecessor denomination to the United Church of Christ. Adams later became a Unitarian, a theological distinction that actually remained a part of the Congregational Church in colonial days until it officially split as a denomination in 18, I think it was 1825. Harvard University, which has congregational roots and related as it was to the Congregational Church, became a center in those days for Unitarian teaching. Samuel Adams was a deacon of Old South Church in Boston. Washington and Hamilton were both Anglicans, or what we know today as Episcopalian. Washington was a vestryman in his church in Virginia, and foundational across the board was the belief that religion was a matter of personal faith. Note that. Personal faith, and they believed that the state or government should stay out of it. Hence, we have the First Amendment, which became known as the Amendment of Separation of Church and State. All of this is strongly reflected in the experience of those early Americans who had their roots in a European culture where the state was either influential or controlled the religious life of the nation. There is a story, it's probably apocryphal, that tells of how Benjamin Franklin po proposed to call in a chaplain to offer a prayer during a very heated debate of a particularly controversial issue in the Constitutional Convention. And this prompted Alexander Hamilton to observe that he saw absolutely no reason to call in foreign aid. 
As I said, I think it's apocryphal. <laughs> but it's a good story. Contrary to contemporary arguments that the founding parents were either not religious or anti-religious, their religious affiliations were pretty traditionally connected for their time. Of those who signed the original founding documents, I'm not talking just about the Declaration of Independence, but the original founding documents, of those who were members of the first Congress, over half of them were Anglican, or again, as we now would call it, Episcopal, uh, Seven were Quaker, three were Roman Catholic, and here I thought was interesting, of our own church traditions, there were 30 Presbyterians, 27 Congregationalists, and a smattering of about six German Reformers who were, of course, the predecessor of the Evangelical and Reformed Church. We hear a lot of talk about freedom and how it is the center of our life together. The War of Independence was fought in order to free the colonies from the monarchy of Great Britain. Shouts of freedom became the burning cry of Independence Day, and we see it as an essential characteristic of who we are as people. But remember, though, that with freedom, comes responsibility. And just as independence, meaning freedom from the rule of others, and in particular, old King George, also meant interdependence. No colonist, no colony could have achieved what was achieved on their own. This was echoed again less than a century later in a nation that exploded into civil war the relationship of the whole and of its many parts is what has always contributed to this nation's greatness. Independence alone becomes emptiness and weakness. Its counterpart, interdependence, and you will learn that's one of my favorite words in this discussion, just as we are interdependent with God, is what lends both spirit and strength. A community, a family, a nation, groupings in which we belong to one another. We belong to one another and to God. Nurture and aid one another and recognize our God-given responsibility to each other. The Civil War General William Tecumseh Sherman succinctly said, war is hell. And it is. He was right. He was the general under Grant who led the devastating march of the Union Army through the South and to the sea. The wholesale destruction left behind was everything that Dante could ever have envisioned in his classic Inferno. War is one of the persistent evils that nations perpetuate over and over again and then rationalize it with nice words and clever patriotic phrases. The Roman Emperor Augustus gave himself the title Prince of Peace, but the peace that he proclaimed was the peace gained through military victory, and domination. It was very much the opposite of the peace proclaimed by Christ, a peace that is truly peace and not simply just another form of oppression clothed in nice words. You know, the true strength of a nation is not measured in its ability to fight wars. We're very good at that but rather, I think, by its ability to prevent them. It's not war that we should celebrate. Rather, it should be the hopes, the dreams, the visions, the beliefs, the yearnings, the convictions, the faith, the hope, the commitment, the aspiration, and the inspiration that is at the core of who we are. 
the very attributes that led those 13 colonies of this fledgling nation to own for themselves the very possibility of freedom and of nationhood. I take seriously that we live in a dangerous world with a serious need for both caution and defense. But you know what? I take even more seriously that we are followers of the Prince of Peace. And that should always mean something very important to the Christian community. Now, I love the passage that Kathy read for us earlier from the Apostle Paul. She put it in a very good context, and it is in every respect, though, a confession of his own failings against the goodness and grace and perfection of God made known in Christ. Paul tells his reader that he cannot do the good that he wants to do, but it is the evil that he doesn't want to do that he winds up doing. This is power for writing on Paul's part. And it is deeply personal, very deeply personal, which is interesting considering that he was writing it in his letter to the Romans, which was the only letter that he wrote to a church that he had not started or had visited before. Powerful writing, deeply personal. He agonizes over his own human frailty and the terrible frustration that is inherent to our human nature. But underscoring all of this, he knows salvation and he knows the gift of the grace of Christ. He knows the grace of God that comes to us through Christ. And he both asks and answers this in questioning, who is it who will rescue him from this body of death? His is the deepest form of confession in the context of faith. He concludes with his joyous affirmation, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I think the time in which we live demands as strong of a witness to our faith and convictions as does either the confessional of St. Paul or those heated days of debate in July of 1776. The times may have changed, but the change has not altered our responsibility as Christian people to witness to the essential truth of our faith. The love of God reverberates through the cries of justice, of freedom, for peace, throughout the land today are as loud as ever, maybe even louder. For the stage today is global, and the sounds of people yearning for freedom and for justice and for peace are lifted before us every day. And as Christians, God expects us to respond, and to respond responsibly. And that, too, is a part of our faith. As we remember the revolutionary forces that helped to shape our nation, let us never forget that the most revolutionary force of all in the whole of creation is the active presence of love, of Christian love, of God's love, of the love that we share with one another and the love that we reach out to the world with. That is the power of Christ with us. If the church is to be the church of Jesus Christ in the world, then the revolutionary impact of pure, unadulterated, caring, deep compassion, justice-making, peace-procuring Christian love has to be at its heart. For the church is a movement with a mission, and its purpose is building communities where both love reigns and the dignity of all people is maintained without prejudice. Inclusive communities where everyone is welcomed, everyone is respected, 
and each is given the opportunity to live up to his or her own God-given potential. Its place is here and now. It looks back and draws power from its source, but the arena, the arena is always the present, and it's time to get busy. Cease to dwell on days gone by, and that simply means quit living in the past. Do not brood over past history, and that means don't long for the good old days. Instead, says the Lord, here and now, I am doing a new thing. And yes, God is doing a new thing among us right here now. We know this in our own congregation as we seek new leadership and explore new directions. We know this in our communities as we seek to transform Rockford and our surrounding towns into a center of just, peaceful, and inclusive opportunities for all. We know this in our nation as we continue to discover new ways to keep the dreams and visions of our founding parents alive and transformative as we embrace the future for our children and for our children's children after them. It's our challenge to continually discover and embrace that new thing and to tackle the problems of this world in the dynamic action of Christian love and in God's presence, and the Holy Spirit's work through us. Happy Independence Day weekend. Amen.